Good afternoon. This is a continuation of the afternoon meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on April 5th, and we are joined now by uh, our colleagues from the Department of Family and Children. Uh, really appreciate you all being here. I think when we originally were thinking about asking you in um, last week, we just have some time on our agenda. It's when we can kind of go deeper into issues that are of importance to all of us. And that's the reason we slotted you. And then there, there is some, uh, we wanted to learn more about the developments with the emergency housing program. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time. And um, Kelly, I'd rather have the general conversation, but maybe you should begin, right, well, however you would like to yeah, approach I, this. But sure, I think what I'll do is I'll start with just a general update of where we're at in the roadmap in terms of just programmatically and, and what happened in the Budget Adjustment Act. And, kind of how we've implemented that. Okay. And then uh, transition to the curveball that the federal government threw last week with yeah. the Treasury guidance for ERAP 1 and ERAP 2 and kind of the work that's going on to kind of analyze that and you know as we as we plan to transition on July 1st to, to the new program. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Sounds good. We've got about an hour. Sure. And we are probably going to be joined, we may be joined by some of our colleagues from other committees who are interested in this too. Sure, and, and with me today, we have a, a team. Um, we have um, <clears throat> Katerina Lasias, a senior advisor to the commissioner. Uh, we also have Nic Nicole Tuzion, who's filling in in the absence of the deputy commissioner right now. Her and Andy Leandra kind of tag teaming and helping uh, keep things moving at the Economic Services Division. And then we have Jillian Niggle, who is um, uh, from our uh, financial office as well, and who is really well versed in this area and has been working with us very closely on ERAP and FEMA and whatnot. And then also we have a Doug okay. Markham here today from a Deputy Secretary. Um, and so at any point, please feel to jump in with questions. Um, as the committee knows, we've been running a very expanded emergency housing program for just the last two years now, funded 100% by FEMA. Um, the language in the Budget Adjustment Act uh, asked us to continue to run that wide open program through the end of this state fiscal year with FEMA, with the understanding that we would develop this new transitional housing program that we would be able to use the federal emergency rental assistance funding, <laughs> ERAP 1 and ERAP 2. And so right now, we have about 1,455 households and motels under the emergency housing program funded by FEMA, and we will continue to operate that program as is through the end of June. Um, at the same time, you know, with the language that was being discussed in the Budget Adjustment Act, we worked with the GA um, uh, housing work group and we developed um, a set of rules and programmatic requirements for the new transitional housing program that will go into effect on July 1st. And so we filed the emergency rules with LCAR on March 31st. And so that program theoretically went live on April 1st for new applicants, even though those in motels now will not transition until July 1st. And so, and we actually have one application from a household that is becoming homeless in the coming days is over income for emer GA emergency housing but it actually meets the income guidelines for the, the new transitional housing program. So we are actually gonna have households in the program earlier than July 1st, as, as if new households come in that meet that criteria. And so it's, so on the first day, we actually had someone come in the door. So that, I think that's a good news story to say that someone in that missing middle, as I would say, a little higher income um, for some of our programs, but meets the income threshold for ERAP. Um, and so, you know, we um, have developed um, uh, the documentation to support the program, working with a work group. Um, we've created um, the occupancy agreement, I'm sorry. Um, um, it's it's a, an agreement that the household in the, in the motel, estab hotel establishment will sign that creates that contract that allows us to use emergency rental assistance for as like a rent payment. It'll be paid in a monthly upfront installment. And also given the, the ability in this program, we're actually able to pay a security deposit upfront as well. 
which helps you know give some security to to the ho the hotels that are participating in the program and so we are um, now uh, working as we transition over the next three months um, our staff are going on site to all of the motels and meeting with the families to um, complete the occupancy agreement and any other documentation we need uh, work with the hotel and it'll all be post dated to go into effect on July 1st so we'll be able to start making those rent payments and security deposits um, for that July 1st launch date for all of these households. And so like we're visiting 40 different hotels across the state this week with our staff and, and economic services doing that work. And that will continue through June so that we can get everyone um, in, into that program uh, when it's ready to go live and we lose the FEMA money and, uh, and the GA program reverts back. And so we're well positioned for that work now. Um, as we designed this program, we were aware that we had two tranches of emergency rental assistance. One was ERAP-1, which was approximately around $200 million, and then um, ERAP-2, which is about $152 million. And I would defer to our financial people to correct me at any point if I misspeak. Um, um, and each household under the, um, under the federal legislation and program is eligible for up to 18 months of emergency rental assistance. So as we developed this program, it was in mind that each household could be eligible for up to 18 months, whether it was in a private market apartment or in a hotel room in the program that we served. Um, also, the, the, um, the funding under the legislation was available to states through September of 25. So we had envisioned running this program through September of 25 uh, if, if there were funds remaining to be able to, to run that program. Um, given much of this was moving quickly at, at the federal level, you know, we had received some initial uh, ERAP-1 guidance uh, led us to believe that we were on, on a good trajectory. Um, and then we were awaiting uh, ERAP-2 guidance in terms of how those dollars could be used in any recapture guidance and, and, and any other requirements. Last week, um, we received some uh, guidance from the federal government that we've been waiting for, for ERAP-2. And it was, it was, I would say, as we categorize it, worst case for the state of Vermont um, in terms of our ability to how far out we can use those dollars and how much have to be obligated by a date certain. And, um, and um, which really, accelerated some of the timelines and the spending that we had anticipated would come under the guidance. So it really um, limits Vermont's options into the future and how it can leverage these funds. In addition, they um, issued some updated ERAP-1 guidance that we were not expecting, which did the same thing. So essentially, both uh, accelerated the timelines that we need to spend and, and how much where it would be recaptured by the federal government and both guidance are really restructured for them to recapture as much money as they can in a short amount of time. And at that point, I would love to have Doug come up and maybe give a little bit more detail on how that will impact Vermont. For us, it, 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 we're, we're doing the calculations to determine how much funding could be recaptured by the federal government in what time frame, and then how much will be left for the state to spend to support ERAP funding across the state and the different uh, programs it's supporting, because it's more than just the transitional housing program, the Vermont State Housing Authority, some uh, stability services through the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, and some other spending as well. And Doug, I would maybe have you jump in here in terms of your initial analysis of, of, of what we're of what we're understanding. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for the record, Douglas Farnham, Deputy Secretary of Administration. Um, so, Madam Chair, I would say the the ERA one guidance. The Treasury had been calculating it on an expense, how much you're expending, how much is going out the door, and. Uh, right before the end of the period, they released this new guidance, which kind of flips their formula on its head and looks at what you have obligated. So we're within six months of the end date of the area one as a fund as of September 30th. Those funds are no longer available um, unless you received a reallocation of funds from another state. Um, and so that was one reason it was crucial that uh, because we had pushed out the emergency and transitional housing program to start July 1st, 
we didn't have obligations on the books and we needed to establish that so the treasury wouldn't take back that $36 million. Uh, so we had kind of a gap in our uh, obligation amount that um, my previous experience with treasury and the recapture formula they used the first two times around is that they are very fond of a one size fits all approach and are, are not really interested in pushback from specific states. Um, basically, I've tried to explain our circumstances to Treasury, how we have utilized FEMA in our planning, and tried to make sure that we are retaining recovery dollars for you know, as long as we can and then spending them intelligently. Um, and the response from Treasury is essentially very diplomatic. Um, that's great for you, but we're gonna need the money back anyway. So um, we, in ERA one, we have ended up sending back 31 million at this point. Under the obligation formula, because of DCF's uh, hard work and quick action, I believe that um, our obligation should be sufficient to avoid a recapture in this calculation. Um, but Treasury leaves the, the door open to say, in June or July, we'll come back and we'll do case by case recaptures. So they're basically saying they're going to scrutinize people's reports and then they may take money back in, in June or July to make sure that states have enough for the last quarter of expenditures. So I think for now, the obligation and obligating that money has served us well. At that point, when they come back in June or July, we will have concrete evidence of agreements that are helping beneficiaries. And they've already said in the law, in the federal law, that they cannot take back money that is obligated to a beneficiary and you can obligate up to 90 days. So this population will be protected for ERA-1 uh, from July through through September. Unless Treasury comes back to us earlier, that could complicate things. And so how we did that just for the committee's information, um, working with uh, Doug's team and Guide House, um, we overnight drafted um, a letter that we finalized the next day because we those letters needed to be in the mail by the close of business that next day. Um, and so we mailed those, you know, uh, drafted those letters, finalized them, got them to our mail center in a mail merge format. And we sent letters to all over 1,500 households at that time that were participating in the motel program. And we were able to put a dollar amount that we obligated in each letter effective July 1st for a three month period, which allowed us to obligate and basically hold on to those funds for those households, as Doug was saying, for ERAPS one. Let's just pause and do some questions. Rep Harrison. Yeah, so I'm trying to understand and get my arms around how the program is changing. I, I get it that you're trying to make program work for reimbursement under this new emergency rental program. But it sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, we went from a night-by-night -night voucher program. You know, you might need a room tonight, but you don't need one tomorrow because you found housing or something. To a three-month rental program, is that what I'm hearing? It's it's a month by month rental, but but um, each household is eligible for up to three months at a time. But we will we will work with each household and establishment and make monthly payments. And, um, okay. And so, so there may not be any incentive for someone if you for three months because they know they've got it covered for three months for housing. Well, whether they're in this program or they find a private, it would be the same uh, federal dollar supporting them. And so in it long term, it is in that household's interest to secure uh, the permanent housing that opens up that we're able to secure for them, because that's a much longer um, opportunity for those households than a motel that might not have a capacity in three months or six months. Okay, so I'm looking at an article that was in last week's, I think it was Rutland Herald, uh, you've probably seen it, the former Holiday Inn, which is lost a franchise or something, now is Cortina Inn. And there's questions being raised under Act 250 permit that they're no longer a motel, they're a some type of other short-term, long-term housing. So it may violate their use. I'm wondering if other places may run into that same type of issue 
I mean, it's a legitimate question from what I read. Understanding the town's inherited some problem with that situation there, and they're not happy, or at least the town government's not happy with the extra costs that they incurred. So I'm trying to understand, if we're doing three months at a time, I mean, it does change the use of that place. Well, well, our agreement is for 30 days at a time. With the, with, you know, but up to 90. You, you, well, that's what a household's eligibility is. Um, a motel could end that relationship under the occupancy agreement. There is language about how they can end that agreement with that household and ask them to leave it at, at you know, and then there's a process how that works and then we would find them a new place to, to avail themselves of, of, of the program. Uh, hotels are private entities. Some are choosing to continue to work in this new program with us, just as they did in the emergency housing program. Uh, some have chosen not to. Um, and then in terms of whether it's a change in use or not, I'm certainly not a land use expert. Yeah, no, I, I understand so, that. That's yeah, not your, yeah. your, your area, so. I would also just add, I guess, for the record, Catherine um, Messias, Senior Vice Commissioner, that we don't contract with an entire hotel. These agreements are between the hotel owner and the participant for one room. So we don't say you must have X amount of rooms to participate in this program. Uh, but essentially, the practice, and at least the Rutland area that I'm aware of, virtually that's the only guest that they have. I mean, it's transferred the hotel. And that, you know, that may be the owner's choice. I, no, I guess. No, and and, and to, I think a little bit to the point you're making, um, the Budget Adjustment Act did have let some language in it that modified because um, there's currently an exemption in the tenancy law for households funded through either medical respite or the general assistance emergency housing program. Um, a modification was made to expand that exception to this new transitional housing program we're running through September of 2025 in Vermont statute. So it does exempt these agreements and households from tenancy. So uh, whether that plays a factor into that calculus or not, but that that was included in the budget adjustment, that statutory uh, temporary revision. So I'd like to come back for a, a moment. I'm still trying to understand what the new big picture is, uh, which so we had had a plan that would have provided for housing of folks without homes for about 18 months. Under the new treasury guidance, we are going to continue using FEMA money until July 1st, and then we've obligated up to three months of the ERAP money, ERAP 2, it sounds like. ERAP 1. Is it 1? Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, yes. And, and we had anticipated that we had additional months of emergency rental assistance available for, for other areas of spending and whatnot um, through September. So we were able to obligate what we had through, through September. Uh, but what that, but some of the other ERAP funding might not be available, which means the state has to transition to ERAP two a little sooner than we anticipated, uh, and, and hit certain spending thresholds there. And Doug could explain yeah. that as well. So there's a couple different components. So, so far, what we've heard about is FEMA gets us to July first, ERAP one gets us from July first to September thirtieth, and then. ERAP 2 gets us some distance further if everything, fingers crossed, everything goes as we understand it. So Madam Chair, yes, it's, that's an excellent question. I think pre-guidance, our, our thinking was exactly along those lines. We would use ERAP 1 up until September 30th and try to use every last dollar of it that we could. And then on October 1st of this year, so six months from now, a little bit less, we would transition and start using that 152 million with the exception of some families timed out of ERA one and they can only get three months of benefits by utilizing ERA two. So spend about four or 5 million to help those 
families that had been receiving assistance for a good amount of time. The Treasury guidance has now put us in a situation where on October 1st, we will have to have spent $78 million of the $152 million. Any dollar less than that that we spend, the Treasury is recapturing. Period. Period. End of story. Um, I think, you know, this just came out last week, so theoretically there could be political discussions, but I do think the national picture of, of rental emergencies in other states and the pressures in California and New York are going to make it very difficult for Treasury to move off of the guidance they've published. Um, and I think as grantees, we're obligated to plan under, under the guidance they've published at this point. So that, that changes dramatically how we've been thinking about it because as of October 1st, we'll have $78 million less than, than, than we had um, planned for just one week ago from today. Um, that money should be, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, Bob, or excuse me, Raquel. So what happens when all this ERAP money and other money dries up? What do you guys do then? And you got, I don't know how many thousands of people out there that you've been keeping warm all winter, feeding all winter and everything else. And now you have no, a year from now, two years from now, you have no money or it's certainly not enough. So I, I think that's why you sense the urgency from the administration and the permanent um, uh, housing investments that the administration's been seeking in the BAA and the 23 budget. Um, and in the 22 budget was our goal was is to um, significantly ex expand the um, permanent housing and shelter capacity in the state to meet the need for these households as, as we've lost some of this federal funding through FEMA and ERAP that allowed us to, to support these programs. Um, you know, and I think, you know, as whether there's general fund available or not in 24 or 25, you know, our focus has been let's build as much permanent low income, modern income and, uh, and for the homeless as we can in the next two years and transition these households into that housing as quickly as we can so that we um, don't have that worry um, in 18 months or 24 months that these households are not in motels, but are in either um, longer term shelter or permanent or, or permanent housing. And so that was the urgency on the administration's part over, over the last year or so was to make sure those dollars are allocated because every dollar we spend on a hotel pays for a night. Every dollar we spend on permanent housing can last a lifetime. Well, there's one win-win on that. And that's most of it will be in the Burlington area and they'll be out of Rowland and up there. I guess I should just consider myself lucky, but those people, I got a call, I spent my lunch hour talking with a guy from Whitehall, New York, that I don't know what he looks like, don't know his name, anything. But his daughter, or his, I'm sorry, his wife and his son work for the Holiday in place, which has renamed themselves, by the way, because Holiday Inn didn't want nothing to do with this, Cortina Inn, all right? And they took a name that had been discontinued in the Rutland area that was very well respected and tried to cover it with that, it didn't work. They worked there. And they've seen the interior horror stories that take place in there. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you all about them. You guys ought to know. But I don't think these are people you want to put millions of dollars into an apartment of some kind for, stick them in there. The apartments last about a year and a half at that. I'm telling you, it's disgusting what's going on down there. And then the daytime, they panhandle all day. All right, they're at the end of Route 4, they're down there at the plaza, and I, I, I'm just tired of it. They just stand there and wait for people to give them change. I mean, we pay for this to happen. No, thank you. Disgusting. And Sean, I'm not blaming you. You've got to run the program, I get it. Don't, this is not personal, but it's just, 
I, I think somebody needs to be a little bit more dull about who we rent to. And I'll tell you another thing. I don't think a lot of them are even from Vermont. I don't know if you have a proof of where you're coming from, but I'm here to tell you, you got into the nitty gritty of the whole thing. I bet you find a lot of Massachusetts, a lot of New York, and a lot of people from other places. I really do. I can't prove that, and I'm not going to try. Thank you. So, um, I think we're probably going to have some different perspectives on on the efficacy of of the program and. Um, and I don't think right now, so my intention right now was to understand the situation of where we are and how we're needing to deviate from the plan. So I try not to have an argument about whether or not we should have had this plan in the first place. Um, others, so I won't go there. Um, the, so, the 152 million that is in ERAP 2, that um, I think there's an unless in the sense that I don't understand, but unless something, 78 million will have to be returned to the federal government um, September 30th. It, 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 so we have to obligate a certain amount. If we fail to obligate that amount, 78 million goes back. Do, do I have the picture? Correct. Correct. And then there's also another spending threshold date of the end of December, which is important to the state as well. So Madam Chair, we have to spend roughly 20% of the money with some you know, complications in the way they calculate 20%. But we have to spend roughly 20% every quarter um, starting uh, four days ago. So uh, that means we have to have approximately 100 million spent by the end of the calendar year. And then if we get to an obligation amount, which can mean our housing stability services grants, which can be longer term, and then obligations to individuals for up to three months of prospective assistance, if we get 114 million at that point, we are no longer going to be subject to the recapture formula. And, um, but, but my way of thinking about it is essentially, we are forced to sprint to that 114 million. Um, and then at 114 million, the program could slow down, but it's hard to slow down once you're moving that fast, right? So we're trying to balance getting to that number very quickly with what happens yeah, so in the first six months of next year. So if you think of, you know, you take 114 million at December when we thought we'd only be spending a couple months worth at that point because we were hoping that we could start spending on N1, now we have to start spending ERAP two now. So if we expend, hit that 114 so we don't have any recaptured, that's out of a total of 152 million dollars. So that's like leaves $38 million of ERAP 2 available to the state in, in to, to going into the new year. Um, and just, you know, we're, we're spending in our, we anticipate spending around 5 million a month or so for this program. And that doesn't take into account some of the housing stability or uh, the VSHA program or, and other spending that might be out there. And so, what we thought would be a bigger chunk of money that could get us closer to that September of 25. We're now looking at probably, you know, Doug and his team and Guidehouse are still doing the calculations, but we're probably getting to end of 23, approximately. And then, so in state fiscal year 24, I think is an open question at this point of what does that look like? And maybe not even to the end of 23. So if, if we have to spend, Assuming nothing's clawed back, if somehow you can make that work, if you have to spend 20% a quarter, you five quarters, that gets us to the third quarter of uh, that, into the third quarter of 23. Approximately, Madam Chair, yes. 
But if we hit that 114, that 20% of yeah. calendar drops off, correct? Yes. Yes. So. But if you hit 114, you only have, I can't do the math, 30 something, yeah. which at five, so that's six. Uh, so maybe it works barely. And it still just gets us to 23. Well, and what we don't know is how, is how quickly some of the, you know, we know those units in shelter capacity are, are underway now. And what we don't know is that's how quickly will some of these come online. Um, uh, also, what we don't know is uh, BSHA's um, rate of, of expenditure, you know, as some of those households hit their 18 months, do their expenditures drop, freeing up more dollars past, you know, there's a lot of still unknowns we don't know yet. Unknowns, I guess I would say. <laughs> um, and so th that's the work we have to do in the coming months is to try to um, come to a, a way to estimate that so we can determine do we get through 23? Do we almost get to 20? I mean, that, that's the work we need to do so we understand. Um, so our planning longer term takes shape. How much is, um, you said BH, BHA I think it was Vermont State Housing Authority. Is that yes? Is yes. There, what are they spending monthly? So Vermont State Housing Authority actually just in March distributed 9.5 million of direct financial assistance. So the, that would all be to people that are in uh, traditional uh, rental arrangements. Um, okay. And I do not believe that includes the utility payments that go through Vermont State Housing Authority right now as well, which would put us up somewhere in the nature of just after $10 million for that month of March. Okay. So that may drop off, so that may free up funds that could be used for this program. Yes and no, Madam Chair. It's still I think the, the unfortunate part of all this is that Treasury has locked us into a situation where we use it or lose it. So even if BSHA produced a lot of capacity, what that would do is it would, it would leave us with one less difficult decision to make next spring. If their program had tapered quite a bit, it would be one less pressure, but we still have to be in a similar financial position at the end of the calendar year, regardless. Um, the one advantage is if we do spend money faster, we then become eligible for reallocations from other states. Um, yeah. On the flip side, we may be able to get some money, but I believe Treasury does that on a per capita basis, so it likely would not be significant amounts of funds. There's really no way to think our way through this. At the end of 23, we're going into 24 with luck. These monies are gone. So Madam Chair, I would say uh, working with AHS right now on just kind of exploring all alternatives and seeing if there's any any way we can use the ERA-1 capacity that we have left and switching. I had to ask VSHA to switch to ERA-2, which means they were the main entity spending our ERA-1 money. So there's a large amount of capacity left in that grant. And if we can find any other creative ways to deploy the money within the federal rules, then we may be able to turn up some other options, but we're still very early in that thinking, and we're just trying to do everything we can to explore options there. So as Doug indicated, so what we, we've created a team met at the agency level with all the commissioners, and we are forming a working group to go through all of our housing spending across the agency to see if there's the ability to utilize that ERAP one that's being freed up from having BSHA switch over to ERAP two to then see if that frees up other money that we can hold in reserve so that we have it to, you know, either for permanent investments to build capacity quicker or to make sure we can get through 23 or, or however long. You know, those are the conversations we're having internal in the work that's going on right now. So there's a lot happening behind the scenes between AOA and AHS. So one of the things that I think about is, I mean, so you've been dedicated to using the FEMA money, totally makes sense, but is it possible to use more of the ERAP money now, hold the FEMA and figure out, you know, the ways we did last year 
you know, are there alternative ways of using FEMA to either use it on the tail end rather than the front end or to use it somewhere else to bring up general funds that we could then divert into this? FEMA is on a reimbursement basis and, and it's authorized on a month by month and 100 percent is only authorized through June 30th. And then I believe beyond that, there's still FEMA money, but it's available with, with a state match. Yeah. So we're, we're not able to like, it's not like we can say, uh, we want 50 million from FEMA and hold on to it. It's, it's a reimbursement. So if we don't, so we won't be able to do that. So. so the way we did last year, we put a significant amount of FEMA money into DOC, for example, and that was, or at least that's my recollection. Maybe I'm totally CRF. wrong. Not FEMA, it was CRF. CRF. Uh, that's that's good. Shoot, that's the difference. So similar concept, with the exception that um, the program has to fit ERAP's yep. criteria, which are very rigid. So we're running through the exercise. It's it's uncertain how successful we'll be in finding programs that might qualify. I think we've got some promising leads, but at the end of the day, it's a very restrictive use of funds, yeah. unlike CRF, which was more fungible. Folks, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Rep <laughs> yeah, I had a question. You you talked in the beginning about we had this program we were going to go through till June, and then we're starting a new program in July. That was the original plan. And, and sort of that's still what you're doing, but the money has become complicated. Um, is there a difference in those housing plans? Have you changed either the eligibility or the criteria or the family size or anything along those lines between our former program and the newer program you were going to? Yes, there is a significant difference in, in some ways. Um, one is um, the first program was the General Assistance Emergency Housing Program, which has a set of rules that have been in existence for a long time. And we waived and varied some to make households eligible who weren't eligible during the pandemic. Um, and then there was also a low income threshold. Um, uh, they, so, and it wasn't like an agreement, like someone was placed there by the state and we had a direct um, fiduciary relationship to the hotel to pay, to, to pay that bill because of that placement and that relationship. Um, under ERAP, it's a transitional housing program, not emergency housing program, so it's a little bit you know, so we're paying out and with the rental assistance, you're eligible at a higher income level. So for instance, that, that one household that came to us on the first day would not have been eligible for the emergency housing program because of their income, they were a little over, but they are eligible for this program. So that they, they are able to be served. Um, and here is a, a written um, occupancy agreement between the household that's staying there in the hotel that outlines that relationship, and we agree to pay the monthly rent payment with the federal emergency rental assistance. So it's a more direct relationship between the household um, and, and, and the, the hotel establishment. And there are a lot less rules than there are under the, because um, it's not um, a financial eligibility program per se, like we traditionally think in the sense it's, a, it's more of a federally funded source that we're using to be creative and be created this program. So it's a little bit different relationship between the establishment and the household. And are the rates that we are paying the same? Um, yeah, the monthly rate yep. is, is basically based on the night that we pay, but and also there's benefit for the hotels this way because of the way we had to, you know, it was a reimbursement with FEMA and the way we had to reimburse and authorize households. It was a really, labor intensive for us in, in terms of hotels getting paid, they had to submit invoices and then wait to get paid. And so here they'll get their monthly uh, rent payment up front and a security deposit, which we weren't eligible in the emergency housing program. So it provides a little bit level of financial security to the hotel as well. Because you increase the eligibility in terms of the income level, do we anticipate more than this 1,500 families that we're currently Managing. We don't anticipate a significant increase, but we like here we we will see some households that may not have been eligible before coming in, um, but we don't expect it'll be a large number. And 
and those households then are eligible for 18 months. Up to 18 Up to months, 18. depending on the availability of the federal funding source. And Rob I would say um, population that, that is using Commissioner Brown's program, there's some overlap in that population and a little bit of back and forth between the BSHA low income population. But at that point, at this point, that BSHA program has helped over 10,000 households, uh, not concurrent, but the total number of households that have used that program. At different times. So I know when we were doing the motel voucher, we were kind of unique. Are any other states doing what we're proposing to do here with the ERAP money um, for whether it be transitional housing or whether it to be extended stays in motels? I, I'm not aware of any other state, but I'm checking with Katarina because she does talk with our delegation and they may be, I didn't know if you learned anything. We're pretty unique. That's, I suspect partly because of the largesse of the small state minimum that we had a totally different set of opportunities than virtually any other state. I mean, what we've seen in some of the much more populous states is these sort of monies just disappear into one city as they, for example, you know, as they fought that sort of issue. So if you, if states are using the ERAP money for what it was perhaps envisioned, um, are other states running out of money? Will they be likely to return funds or are they because of, you know, high demand in an urban setting, they're using it all for the purpose that it was perhaps envisioned? So I would say that um, yeah, many of the larger states with more metropolitan areas have run out of funds, have been receiving reallocations at this point. Um, as far as from a risk perspective, Guidehouse was able to find some parallels to our program design. So even though we're, we're doing something on a larger scale than is seen in other states, they did find counties and other jurisdictions that were doing similar programs. So we're comfortable Treasury's not going to come back and try to take back the money at the end of the day. But um, yeah, the majority of large states have run out of funds and are requesting reallocations. And some of the small states, there was one example, I think North Dakota, where they voluntarily reallocated over $100 million, uh, which is not something I would recommend. Um, and uh, yeah, there have been a small number of voluntary reallocations, but I think the, that has been the main driver behind Treasury pushing ERA one and ERA two recaptures much more strong. So when you say reallocated, reallocated where? Back to the Treasury or to another program in the state? So the Treasury publishes. They they take it. Um, they have structures for voluntary reallocating money within your within your state. Like if we had larger met, metropolitan areas, we could have. You know, if Burlington was much larger. We could have reallocated to Burlington instead of losing thirty one million. Um, but in many cases, it just goes back to Treasury, joins a central pool, and then is distributed out to states that have a reallocation request in. And then that's based on the estimated size of need, the number of applications. I know that New York's program is, is massive um, and has significant unmet need. It's not as if we could take the ER, ERAP money and put it into an ARPA pod and use it for economic development or recovery. That's that's not a possible reallocation. I would suggest that we are doing exactly what was uh, envisioned with the emergency rental assistance program, is that we're providing emergency rental assistance, in this case, in the version of helping people without homes be safe during the pandemic. When I think of what this state has done during the past two years, the two things that I and I will always, but for the rest of my life, be grateful for. One is we pulled together, we said we're going to solve this problem and as Vermonters, we're going to stand together and help each other. 
recover through this, survive and recover. And the second, which is really a subset of the first, is we said we're not going to see people without homes on our streets or in the woods or under the bridges. We're going to figure out how to keep them safe. So I'm, I, I was so happy that we had this plan that really gave us enough time to figure out how to find permanent affordable housing. And honestly, 25 was barely long enough. There's no way in the world that we can build 1,500 homes. And we have been failing to do that for decades to be meeting our housing capacity. So we were just barely going to be hanging on by our fingers to get there at 25. And so this is totally changing what we're looking at. In. It's not because we're failing to put enough housing money on the table that this is going to be a problem. We never were going to be able to build enough homes by next year to serve this population. So this is going to have to continue standing together, trying to figure out how to solve this problem so that people are not being put out on, again, on the streets or back into the woods, wherever they've been trying to cobble together a life. Um, go ahead. Um, okay. I know how, how concerned you all have been. Um, so you've, you've notified people of, of what the benefit's going to be. Have you gotten any response from that yet? Um, I mean, I know the letters just went out on Friday. What are you hearing yeah, from heard, your folks? At this point, we've not heard. You know, we tried to message it to our partners so that, uh, that they were, many of them are on site providing services so that they can answer questions. Um, we've not seen an uptick in our phone lines with a lot of uh, concern or confusion at this point, but we are monitoring it and are ready to you know, provide information yeah. on those that call. In. So, we did work very hard to make sure that that letter was language was pretty clear and, and didn't create panic for the households. That was one of our yeah. to make sure they were already anxious enough regarding this transition from this one program to the other that we didn't want to raise alarm for this letter, but it was really necessary to obligate these funds before they get the government tried to grab them. Yeah. Back, so. So with the issuance of that letter, how much did you obligate in total? It was three months worth of rent and a security deposit. I can't remember the exact dollar amount now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was the three months that we were able to on top of um, uh, the security deposit. And then there's also this other payment we've created um, uh, for households that really struggled to stay housed and what we call the heart, heart to house payment to help provide support to the motel to maintain guests who really struggle with different, with different issues to help them maintain housing. So. so let me just make sure I've got it in my head. The three months is July through the end of September. And then again, fingers crossed, no changes, could be changes. It sounds like you're kind of anticipating there could be changes. But We're anticipating ERAP 2 being available for, for um, October, November, and December. And we believe, hopefully, what, that's the work we're doing in through the next two quarters of 23. And that's the analysis we're doing right now to see, based on the expenditure rates and, and the re, and, you know, potential recapture, how much funds are we anticipate being available into calendar year 23 for those first two quarters of state fiscal year 23. Last two quarters, excuse me. You, you, with what we know right now, we're good through the end of calendar year 22. Yes, and then we believe the first quarter of 23, potentially, that we're working on the analysis for the last quarter of state fiscal year 23, June from April. So you think we're good for the, for the, I'm losing my quarters in here. I'm sorry, I contributed. For January through 
March, you think we're good. So it's really the scary part, the worrisome part is the last quarter of 23. And there's and then there's nothing in 24. It would be difficult, Madam Chair, to design a program that would stretch in that manner. Like theoretically money could be available, but it is challenging. That's one thing we're working on right now, trying yeah. to figure out. Yeah. And I, I would say um, I'm going to be monitoring all the programs. So DCS programs are two of the programs that utilize this fund. And because it's an AA1 approval, this is such a tightly focused yeah. use of funds that it went through the JFC A1 process. Yeah. And ERA2 is the same CFDA number, the same, it's a continuation. So in AOA, I'm monitoring the programs and trying to push every expenditure above the required spending amount for ERA2 into ERA1 so that we can come out of this reconciliation process with as much ERA2 as possible without having any recapture because that could Yep. also limit our options in FY23 and FY24. So that will be a constant yeah. <laughs> for this year. Yeah. I'm sorry, you thought you were kind of over the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Rex Jessa? One of the thoughts running through my head just before you came into the room, uh, we had colleagues from the NCSL here, and they were talking about a third COVID bill which, as I understood, did not allow for rescissions. And we're talking about reallocation versus rules, but is yeah. there any potential hope along those lines? I, I do not believe so, because the, reallocate, the reallocation structure is written into the program for ERA 1 and ERA 2. So it's not what the federal, oh, how to say this properly. Um, there's been a lot of talk of, pulling some money back from states that spent different types of COVID allocations and then using it for other purposes. This is all internal to the workings of the ERA program. I could be wrong. There could be a direct strike through of the programmatic language, but because the money's not leaving the emergency rental assistance program, I don't think that that's what that um, federal language was envisioned to do. Um, so I, I don't think that protects us, but I haven't done the actual research there, so I'm not certain. Are you going to be, as the end of the money approaches, are you going to be looking at participation and the populations who are participating? And I mean, it, you, you clearly are going to have to start thinking about how the most vulnerable folks are protected and, and how that's going to be managed. That's the work that's happening internal as well. We've brought, a, a, again, an interagency team together from um, Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, Departmental Health Corrections, to understand who's our population in, in, you know, in the current program, in the transitional program, and how do we focus um, our work there to make sure that um, those that are the most vulnerable who are serving, that we know and work very hard to get them into the permanent um, housing arrangement as quickly as possible. So that work is happening as well. Yeah, of course, Rep. Uh, Rep. Stead. Thank you. I, I'm just curious, that made me think of something. So we know there are about 1,500 families. And we know that you all are working as hard as we can to get enough building done to get some of these out of the transitional motel programs into housing. Um, how close do you think we'll be? What will be the short if this plays out the way you just described? I don't, uh, I will say that that's the analysis we need to do. I have not, you know, given the work here of launching this new program and the curveball, we need to you know, kind of circle back to the HCP, see what projects are in the works, their estimated completion date, their capacity, and where they're located, because those are all important components. And then also look at what would the additional funds being allocated for that work through the, tw the 23 uh, budget, you know, what do we anticipate for projects, how quickly some can come on quicker than others, depending on the type of project. 
Um, and then we'll be able to, you know, because we have to crosswalk it with our district data where they're being built because it could be uneven across the state depending on where the projects are and the timelines. And so it could be a different response depending on the area of the state and the need. So that brings me to another question, which is we know that our towns, some of our municipalities are struggling, the ones that have more motels in the program than others. They might, have, you know, they might be at 15% or only 3%, right? Depending on how many pro, how many motels get into the program. We know now that there are gonna be families that we might not be able to find. We're gonna to have to really put on our thinking caps to figure out what happens. One of the things that I keep wondering is that some of those towns who are getting hit hard by a lot of folks and not enough services to meet the needs. For example, police being called over and over, losing lots of their police force to, through this program. They're gonna be less apt to want to work together with the state to figure out that next, that next step. And now we know that next step is actually gonna be a lot quicker than we thought. And so, is there a way with some of this money that you're trying to quickly spend to, to help out some of these towns so they are more apt to find a way to put their arms around those folks who we are going to be struggling to find a spot for, but that way it doesn't all land in one place either. It, it allows us to spread that out a little, but we have to help them I think now a little bit, and it also helps you with your problem, which is spend money quickly. And I just wonder if you, if that's possible, if that's something you can look at. I would say generally no. Um, the federal, so 80% of the money has to go to direct financial assistance. So out of the 200 million we were given, that's down to 169 million. 80% of that has to go to direct financial assistance um, to, the, to the beneficiaries and can't be used for anything else. 10% of it can be used for housing stability services. And there might be creative ways we can approach housing stability services, but Treasury does have that fairly well defined. It wouldn't incorporate public safety, but it could incorporate additional caseworker support for a household that's struggling with issues. Um, that is something that maybe we could stand up to happen between now and September uh, and spend from the ERA-1 fund. It wouldn't change our October 1 forward situation because at that point we only have ERA-2 to spend and at that point we're still locked into that trajectory that Treasury has set for us. Um, but I think we can, we do have capacity in our housing stability services budget and we could definitely explore if there are any ways we could use that money that we haven't been thinking of yet. And I can say that we've been very engaged with the local communities across the state. We meet regularly with some municipal leadership or first responder leadership on a regular basis. Um, and that also I've, I've met with um, Central Vermont and Northern Vermont and had some pretty significant conversations um, and some of that is if they have an idea, you know, we direct them to the B, to BHCB where they're allocating. If they have a project they want to move forward, we certainly make those connections for them. But also some communities are taking upon themselves to use their, their own direct ARPA allocations that cities got through through some of the federal government spending um, to, to create their own. I know in Barrie, they're trying to use some of that money to create some permanent housing. In Burlington, the mayor, City Council has approved it. Uh, the, you know the pods um, that would be there for three years will be coming online. I think thirty pods, um, for, um, pretty innovative approach. Um, and so, and I, and I know those conversations are happening, and we try to support them wherever we can um, to encourage communities because they're they're notwithstanding some of the pressures that this you know is happening with uh, communities where there's large number of hotels. Um, I'd say without fail, there is support to continue to, you know, in those communities to serve the vulnerable households, homeless households in this program. Um, and, and, and 
want to do do whatever they can to be a part of the solution. Uh, Reptile. Not to linger, but I just felt I should tell you that I did give the guy at Whitehall's name, your name, <laughs> what we call DCF Chandra. I if, I'll, I'll he's just, a gentleman. He's a decent guy. Well, I'll just say that if we get reports of, of um, some poor conditions, we work very closely with our partners at the health department who um, are statutorily tasked with inspecting uh, lodging establishments, and, and they do go out when we make a referral, and you know, and, and they, um, if needed, ask the establishment to bring up. And if we see other situations, we've brought in the fire marshal if, if there were uh, other safety concerns. And so we do work closely with communities where, where issues have been brought to our attention to make sure those situations get get remedied as quickly as they can. But we have to rely on our partners whose work, the sphere of work that is, to, to, to move that forward. And we do that. That's part of the problem. I think you've got a couple out of state concerns that don't care. And what I fear is if it continues to go on in four more years, they'll walk away and go back to where they came from, take their pockets full of money. And those two buildings will sit there and fall into the ground before the legalities get squared away with them all. I understand your concerns. I will say that, you know, where we have had those concerns and we've worked with motel ownership to correct the problems and they've been slow to do that, we stopped working with them. And, and that caught their attention and they made the changes they need to do. And so, I mean, we do have systems and mechanisms to, um, you know, Provide a better service for, for the program, and, and we do utilize those tools when we need them. Well, excuse me, but the mechanisms aren't working all that good yet. Thank you. So I, I, it, we're kind of at time. I'm not seeing that there are any more questions, and I'll come back to my observation that I'm extremely proud of what we have attempted to do. We haven't always gotten it right. But I think from we said we're going to take care of Vermonters. We're going to figure this out. We're not going to leave people on the streets. And I really appreciate you know all all of you in state government. DCF has been it's kind of the the epicenter of this. And Mr. Farnham, I yeah, I'm sorry that you're still in in the epicenter of this. I don't envy you your job. Um, Somebody has to do it without the chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rep. Jessup. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in as well. I know it was a Herculean task to reach all of those households yes. in such a short time frame. Yes. And I can only imagine what sorts of logistics were involved. So. Hats off to that. And I also just want to say to Mr. Farnham that I, for one, really appreciate the upfront transparency. And it's our job as elected or as administration of this to solve problems. That's what we're sent here to do. So thank you. OK, thank you. So I have a feeling we'll be talking about this. Oh, I'm sorry, Rep Fagan. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I sent you an email. Um, it, you'll you'll get it. It's got my phone number on there. Give me a call, please, as soon as possible. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I hope the next time we're together, we have really great, you know, optimistic. We're, we've got this solved. Um, if, if there is optimism here, we will, in a short period of time, we're able to create this program yeah. and launch it. And so, I mean, we do. Yeah. You know, it, it is going into a you know these households will be served on yeah. online first and that we need to look at the positive on that side yes a a absolutely and congratulations for doing that yeah okay thank you all so folks we are that's it for today believe it or not we continue to have this lackadaisical schedule i think we are together at 8 30 tomorrow yes. am i remembering correctly we're going to hear from secretary moore yep. on the um climate invest investments and next steps 
Um, and then a personal favorite of mine, a conversation about universal basic income and um, education finance after that. We actually have a fuller day tomorrow. Um, does anybody have anything else for us before we go off live? I don't see anything. So thank you. See you in the morning. <laughs>